It was springtime. The moon was full. Before the sun would rise, Siddhartha's long search would be over. He sat down under a Bodhi tree in the shelter of the natural world in all of its beauty and fullness. And he said, I will not move from this place until I have solved my problem. Let my skin and sinews and bones dry up, together with all the flesh and blood of my body, he said. I welcome it. But I will not move from this spot until I have attained the supreme and final wisdom. All at once, Mara, Lord of Desire, rose to challenge him. With an army of demons, he attacked. Siddhartha did not move, and their weapons turned into flowers. Mara is the ruler of this realm of desire, this world that we all live in. And what he's afraid Siddhartha is going to do when he attains enlightenment and becomes the Buddha is conquer that world. That is, he's going to do away with desire. He's going to, he's going to wreck the whole game. Mara did not give up. He sent his three daughters to seduce him. Siddhartha remained still. When he faces Mara, he faces himself and his own destructive capacity. But he's not the warrior trying to do battle with those qualities. He's discovered his own capacity for equanimity. He has become like, uh, you know, the top of the great Himalayan mountains, you know. The weather is passing over him, storms are raging around him, and he sits like the top of the mountain, Im impassive, not in a trance state, you know, totally aware of everything. So he frustrates Mara. Siddhartha resisted every temptation Mara could devise. The Lord of Desire had one final test. He demanded to know who would testify that Siddhartha was worthy of attaining ultimate wisdom. And his demon army rose up to support him. Siddhartha said nothing. He reached down and touched the ground, and the earth shuddered. Mara's demons fled. The Buddha reaches down and with his finger touches the earth. He says, the earth is my witness. He said, Mara, you are not the earth. The earth is right here beneath my finger. And the, the earth is what we're talking about. Accepting the earth, not owning the earth, not possessing the earth, but the earth just as it is, abused and exploited and despised and rejected and uh, plowed and mined, spat on, and everything else, you know, uh, it's still the earth, and it's, it is, uh, it's, we owe everything to it. Siddhartha meditated throughout the night. 
and all his former lives passed before him. He remembers all his previous lives, infinite numbers of previous lives. Female and male and every other race and every other being in the vast ocean of life forms. And he remembered that all viscerally, so that means his awareness expanded to, rem to be all, so the, all the moments of the past were completely present to him. He gains the power to see the process of birth, death, and rebirth that all creatures go through. He's given this sort of cosmic vision of the workings of the entire universe. As the morning star appeared, he roared like a lion. My mind, he said, is at peace. The heavens shook, and the Bodhi tree rained down flowers. He had become the awakened one, the Buddha. Something new opens up for him, which he calls uh, nirvana, or which he calls awakening. He said, at this moment, all beings and I awaken together. So it was not just him, it was all the universe. He touched the earth, as earth is my witness. Seeing this morning star, all things and I awaken together. It's not like entering a new state, it's uncovering or surrendering to the reality that has always been there. He realized he'd always been in nirvana, that nirvana was always the case. Your reality itself is nirvana. It's the unreality, it's your ignorance that makes you think you're this self-centered, separate being trying to fight off an overwhelming universe and failing. You are that universe. You're already enlightened. He's saying the, the capacity for enlightenment, that your, your awakeness already exists within you. Nirvana is this moment seen directly. There is nowhere else than here. The only gate is now. The only doorway is your own body and mind. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing else to be. There's no destination. It's not something to aim for in the afterlife. It's simply the quality of this moment. Just this, just this, this room where we are. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to who's there. Pay attention to what's, what isn't known there. Pay attention to what is known there. Pay attention to what everyone is thinking and feeling. What you're doing there and pay attention. Pay attention. For weeks, the Buddha remained near the Bodhi tree, peaceful and serene. He was tempted to retire into a profound solitude instead of trying to teach others what it had taken him six long years to discover for himself. He wants to stay there. He's very happy. He doesn't want to go out. He, he says to himself, no one is going to understand this. You know, people are going to think I'm crazy. They're going to think I'm nuts. Buddha saw the nature of the people envy and jealousy and strong negative mental states. Uh, all the people in the world, they are like uh, the fishes uh, um, riddling in the very shallow water. So Buddha, uh, he himself, afraid to teach uh, the people. The myth is that a god comes to the Buddha. Brahma comes on his knees and says, please, we need you. Why don't you try talking about what you just understood? Because 
the world needs it, the gods need it, and the men need it, you know, people need it. And then Buddha decided uh, to, to, to give his teachings. Because of the great compassion, it's not an ordinary compassion. When you feel the feelings of others, you automatically don't want them to feel bad. You feel the feeling of your hand, you don't put it in the oven. <laughs> I mean, you're not, you're not being compassionate to your hand, you just feel the pain, so you don't have to put it there. So you feel others' pain, you're going to do your best to help them alleviate it. When somebody becomes enlightened, something blooms in his heart. It's like a flower blooms and it cannot hold the fragrance. It has to naturally release. So it's like he naturally had to release his radiance. He has to share this joy that was in his heart. 35 years old, the Buddha would devote the rest of his life to bringing his teachings, the Dharma, the fundamental laws of all things, into the world. But as he had feared, it would not be easy. As he set off to share what he had learned, he met a wandering ascetic. Who is your guru? the ascetic asked him. The Buddha said he had no guru that he had attained enlightenment on his own. It may be so, the ascetic said, and walked away. On his first attempt to teach, the Buddha had failed. Buddha meets someone who doesn't see anything special about him. Because the awakened Buddha doesn't look any different from anybody else, he is ordinary. Buddhism is not about being special. Buddhism is about being ordinary, and it is not about the continual exudation of bliss. It is about walking a normal human life with normal human beings, doing normal human things, and this reminds you that you yourself might be a Buddha at this moment. The person you're looking at might be one. It's an interesting practice. Just each person you see as you walk down the street Buddha? 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 From Bodhgaya, the Buddha walked west nearly 200 miles and crossed the Ganges River. He was still searching for a way to explain to others what he feared was unexplainable, the path to the enlightenment he himself had experienced. In a deer park in Sarnath, not far from the Ganges, he would try again. His five former companions were still practicing the austerities he himself had abandoned. From far off they saw me coming and, on seeing me, made a pact with one another, the Buddha recalled. Friends, here comes Siddhartha, living luxuriously, straying from his ascetic practice. He doesn't deserve to be bowed down to. These are his buddies who were just disappointed and disgusted with him for giving in after they'd all been trying to uh, starve themselves into enlightenment. Um, so they... Uh, they're a little distrustful at the beginning. They refer to him as an equal, and he then tells them, no, that's not the term you should use when you refer to a tathagata, to a, a being who's gone beyond. Um, and so he sets them straight. Uh, and they then become the first people to hear the content of what he realized under the Bodhi tree. His first teaching would later be called setting in motion the wheel of the Dharma, because it brought the Buddha's message into the world for the first time. He did not propound a dogma. Instead, he spoke from his own experience, out of his own heart. He had known the abandon of the sensualist and the rigors of the ascetic. Now, he would disavow both of them. 
The Buddha said, I've discovered a new way, and it's not the path of asceticism, and it's not the path of sensory indulgence. It's the middle way. What the Buddha was always doing was saying everything's, everything needs to be balanced. So, you know, the middle way was always balancing between, you know, excesses on this side, excesses on the other side. Fair goes the dancing when the sitar is tuned. Tune us the sitar, neither high nor low. And we will dance away the hearts of men. But the string too tight breaks. And the music dies. The string too slack has no sound. And the music dies. There is a middle way. Tune us the sitar, neither low nor high. And we will dance away the hearts of men. The path to enlightenment lay along the middle way, the Buddha taught, and the ascetics listened. Now he would answer the question that six years before had provoked his spiritual journey, the question of suffering. Buddhists don't have a creation story. There is no creator deity. Um, it's not really an, it, of interest. It's, it's not an issue. Um, what's of interest is uh, the problem of human suffering and the solution to human suffering. Pretty much everything else right, is beside the point. The Buddha's analysis of suffering came in the form of what have come to be called the Four Noble Truths. There is no commandments or anything. The first noble truth is that there is suffering in this world. Generally, this suffering has been mistranslated. Suffering is not entirely accurate to the word that the Buddha probably used. It means something closer to dissatisfaction, that, you know, we're never quite happy, and if we are, that's gone in an instant anyhow. And he says that this suffering, this unsatisfactoriness, doesn't arise by itself. It has causes. Our own mind causes it. While the second noble truth asserts that suffering has a cause, the third noble truth makes an astonishing claim. You really can be free of suffering by understanding the cause of suffering. Nobody tells you that. And so that was a huge announcement. The problem Buddha taught is desire. How to live with the confused and entangling desires of our own minds. People often misunderstand Buddhism as saying, in order to wipe out suffering, you have to wipe out desire. If that was what the Buddha was saying, then where does the desire for enlightenment fit in? You know, uh, the Buddha is saying, be smart about your desires. Desire must be there. Without desire, how can we lead our life? Without desire, how can we achieve Buddhahood? Strong desire to become Buddha. But desire to harmful, oh, that bad. With the fourth and final noble truth, the Buddha laid out a series of instructions for his disciples to follow, a way of leading the mind to enlightenment called the Noble Eightfold Path, the cultivation of moral discipline, mindfulness, and wisdom. They are, as I like to think of them, a set of possible recipes um, that you can uh, try on your own life and see which one makes the best soup. The Buddha didn't speak for long, but when he was finished, the five skeptical ascetics had been won over. They became his first disciples. 
Word quickly spread of the sage teaching in the deer park at Sarnat. Hundreds came to hear him and became disciples too. Many were wealthy merchants or their sons, living just five miles away in a thriving trading center on the Ganges, the holy city of Banares. Today, Benares is the most sacred city in all of India, as it has been for millennia. Even before the time of the Buddha, pilgrims came here to worship their gods and bathe in the holy river of heaven. You see people purifying themselves, bathing in the Ganges. You see priests performing rituals. You see corpses, because that's the best place to end one's life. So you see going on there a great range of religious activity and much of it of the type that does go back to the Buddhist time. Many of today's sacred ceremonies on the Ganges echo the ancient practices of the Vedic priests, the Brahmins. In the Buddha's day, only the Brahmins could mediate between the gods and men. Only they could conduct the holy rituals that were said to preserve the universe itself. The Brahmin priests stood at the pinnacle of a rigid social hierarchy, a sacred system of caste. Beneath them were the warriors, the caste to which the Buddha belonged. Below them were farmers. At the bottom were the servants, and still lower, outcasts. Those social groups are not merely social conventions, but rather they're hardwired into the nature of the universe. Um, you're supposed to stay in that group, and the survival of society depends upon your continuing to perform the function associated with that social status. Caste was irrelevant to the Buddha. So were priestly rituals to preserve the universe. His teachings focused on the universe within. The Buddha said, you could be from any caste. What, what makes you noble is if you understand reality. You know, if you're a good person, if you're a wise person, uh, then you're noble. In time, a devoted gathering of monks formed around the Buddha at Sarnath, near the Ganges. Broken stones and fallen pillars mark what remains of what grew to be a vibrant monastic community, the Sangha. took the Buddha many, many years to find his way, but he didn't want it to be so hard for people. And so he established a community who could live together and help one another.
In a ceremony evoking the beginning of the Buddha's own spiritual journey, fledgling monks of all ages say goodbye to their families and homes and join the Sangha. Gachami, Dutiyampi, Dhammam, Saranam, Gachami. I go to the refuse of the Buddha, I go to the refuse of the Dhamma, and I go to the refuse of the Sangha. Sangang, Saranang, Gachami. The Sangha is an embodiment of Buddha's experiential wisdom. What happens if people practice this thing? Are they truly happy or not? Are they joyful or not? So I think Buddha wanted to also leave a, a perfect example of his teaching, an alive teaching, a teaching that walks, a teaching that can talk, a teaching that can laugh. So I would say Sangha is just like a living example of Buddha's teaching. The first Sangha was a radical institution, open to people of every caste and remarkable for the times in which the Buddha lived, to both men and women. The Buddha was part of a culture deeply suspicious of women. The attitude towards women at the time was very critical, and many things were impossible for them. So that was a very revolutionary thing to do that in that times of India. By ordaining women as nuns, the Buddha gave women the chance to escape the drudgery of daily life. Life was so hard for most women that entering the Sangha was a liberation, as we know from their ecstatic, heart-rending poems. So freed, so freed, so thoroughly freed am I from my pestle, my shameless husband and his sunshade-making, my moldy old pot with its water snake smell. Aversion and passion I cut with a chop. Having come to the foot of a tree, I meditate, absorbed in the bliss. What bliss? Bliss, nirvana, the Buddha taught, could be found in the fleeting moment through the practice of meditation. The Buddha showed his followers how to come to terms with their own roiling thoughts and desires by paying attention to them, by becoming aware, becoming mindful. As an ancient poem counsels, like an archer, an arrow, the wise man steadies his trembling mind, a fickle and restless weapon. Many times our mind is not peaceful enough. So we realize that perhaps we need to understand more about mind itself and how to balance the emotions, how to balance our mind and try to cultivate more happiness. The difficulties come from within. One experiences uh, unexpected things from one's mind, most uh, dangerous skeptical doubts, doubts about oneself, doubts about the Buddha. Physical is we can get from, <laughs> from, from the food and from the supplement of vitamins and uh, yeah, and for the mind, this is the only only way we have to. Only medicine. <laughs> Meditation is not about getting rid of anger, getting rid of lust, or getting rid of jealousy. Even while becoming monk, often we experience anger. It happens. <laughs> it often happens when people start teasing you like a shaven, bald head person. <laughs> but it gives a good chance for us to realize that, okay, let's see, this anger arises. What is it? What most often happens in our ordinary life is that whenever we experience these emotions, we get stuck into it. It starts twisting us. 
But Buddhism is going through inside it and getting out of it peacefully. And I think that gives us more joy. And that makes human life more full, more, more around. It's not like we, we are not living in partial truth, but it's like a whole of things together. It takes time to comprehend this. And then, by practicing again and again, the practitioner becomes very balanced, and one reaches a state of very strong equanimity. Equanimity towards uh, the physical and mental objects. And this is the base camp for the summit. Enlightenment. After washing my feet, a disciple said, I watched the water going down the drain. I am calm. I control my mind like a noble thoroughbred horse. Taking a lamp, I enter my cell. Thinking of sleep, I sit on my bed. I touch the wick, the lamp goes out. Nirvana. My mind is freed. The mind is as restless as a monkey, the Buddha taught. Who you are, what you think of as yourself, is constantly changing. Like a river, endlessly flowing, one thing today, another tomorrow. There's water in a river, then there's water in a glass, and then the water is back in the air, and then it's back in the river. The water's there, but what is it? That's a way to think about the self in Buddhism. One moment you're angry, the next moment you're laughing. Who are you? A seed becomes a plant. Wisps of grass are spun into a rope. A trickling stream turns into a river. The self comes and the self goes. Simply notice how from one moment to another, your self is actually not as much the same as we think it is. What the Buddha realizes is that if we can get rid of this fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of the self based on egotism, we won't cling to things, we won't screw up everything we do because we're thinking about it in the wrong way. Once you stop centering your, your feelings about your feelings on yourself, the, what naturally arises is, is simple compassion. Compassion for your own suffering, compassion for the suffering of others. Even the most abstract of the Buddha's teachings had a practical, ethical dimension. Compassion, the Buddha taught, comes from understanding impermanence, transience, flow, how one thing passes into another how everything and everyone is connected. When this is, that is. From the arising of this comes the arising of that. When this isn't, that isn't. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that.
This is always connected to that. Everything is connected to everything else. You never live by yourself. You live always within a family, a society, a culture. You constantly uh, interact with other people all the time. So our happiness depends on their happiness as well. How can we be happy if we are the only one happy in uh, an, uh, you know, just an island of happiness within an ocean of misery? Of course, that's, that's not possible. Compassion stirred the Buddha to send his monks out into the community. Sworn to chastity and poverty, they wandered the roads, bringing the Buddha's teachings into the world. Go forth, monks, for the happiness of the many, out of compassion for the world. There are beings whose eyes have little dust on them, who will perish if they do not hear the teaching. But if they hear the teaching, they will gain liberation. The monks exist by begging. We think of begging as kind of a bad thing. Begging in this tradition is a good thing. It's a sign of spiritual purity. You're not allowed to beg tomorrow's lunch today. Only today's lunch. Then you can't eat from noon until dawn the next day. Then you have to go out and get another lunch. And then in exchange for lunch, you give a lecture. Unless they say, we don't want to hear about it, then you don't. But that's the only thing you, but that forces you to interact with the lay community. And if you're not serving them, if you're not doing something useful for them, they won't put anything in your bowl and that will be the end of your community. The Buddha himself wandered across Northeast India, teaching and gathering new disciples everywhere he went. You didn't have to become a monk or a nun to become a Buddhist. The Buddha's teachings were for everyone. Everything is burning. What is burning? The eyes are burning. Everything seen by the eyes is burning. The ears are burning. What is burning? Everything heard by the ears is burning. The nose is burning. Smells are ablaze. The tongue is burning. Tastes are ablaze. The body is burning. The mind is burning. We're on fire. We may not know it, but we're on fire, and we have to put that fire out. We're burning with desire, right? We're burning with craving. Um, everything, everything um, about us is, is out of control. The Buddha goes on to talk about the three poisons, greed and anger and ignorance, and how the, the three poisons are what is making the fire, and the way out of doing this is not to deny the three poisons, but to recognize that if you turn them round, you come to their opposites. Instead of greed, you have generosity. Instead of anger, you have compassion. And instead of ignorance, you have wisdom. I can give my teachings in brief, the Buddha said. I can teach in detail. It is those who understand that are hard to find. There are stories of people coming to the Buddha 
and saying, I am leaving your teaching because you have not told me about whether there is a life after death or whether there is another world. And the Buddha says, did I ever say that I would give you the answer to these things? No, Lord, you didn't. Why do you think that I never said that I would give you the answer to these things? Because these are not the things that you need to know. The thing that you need to know is how to deal with suffering. Because at this very moment, what made you ask that question was suffering. The Buddha was, above all, a pragmatist. He did not expect his followers to agree with everything he said. He encouraged them to debate and argue, to challenge him. Buddhists say, my follower should not accept my teaching out of devotion, but rather your own experiment. Even Buddha himself, in order to get final enlightenment, need hard work. So investigate based on reason, through logical investigation. If something contradict uh, in the Buddha's own word, then we have the right to reject that. As the Buddha gathered more and more followers, stories spread of his miracles, which mixed the marvelous with the mundane. One story tells how 500 pieces of firewood split at the Buddha's command. In another, a mad elephant charged wildly down the street, forcing everyone to flee. Only the Buddha remained, quietly waiting. The elephant, overcome by the Buddha's radiant kindness, knelt before him, and the Buddha patted his leathery trunk. What is the meaning of miracle? Miracle is something unexpected. I think uh, 100 years ago, jumbo jets, or some of these really computers, or these, I think, uh, uh, in, in their eye, this is our something miracle. Because a miracle is something cannot understand. So now, I think within this century, we may find some new ideas or new facts. So far, we spent all our energy and time for research on matter, not internal world. This, this skull, Small space, but a lot of mysterious things still there. The great field of knowledge is as tiny as the Earth is in the universe. I mean, it's a, tiny, it's a speck. In, and the, the, the universe is what we don't know. And it will always be that way. This, however, however much we find out, it will still be that way. Because the unknown is vastly, it is, it's, it's unspeakably greater than anything we will ever know. In one of the most storied miracles, the Buddha strode on a jeweled walkway suspended in mid-air, while streams of water spouted and flames flashed from his body, shooting out to the very edge of the universe. And as the Buddha sat on a lotus flower giving his teachings, he replicated himself, filling the sky with multitudes of Buddhas for all to see and wonder. Do we believe that literally? Does it matter whether we believe it literally? What many of those miraculous stories are about is, is the sheer wonder the very fact that the whole of unknown time and space has led down to this, led to this very moment when we're 
sitting here talking to, and we are sitting here talking to each other, is utterly miraculous. Sitting here in a room, having had a cup of coffee, having taken it out of a beautiful blue and white porcelain mug, what could be more miraculous than that? Um, everyday life around us is already so implausible and so glorious that what need for further miracles? And that's the teaching of the Buddha. That's the miraculous teaching of the Buddha. Violence, the Buddha taught, always leads to more violence. To the slayer comes a slayer. To the conqueror comes a conqueror. He who plunders is plundered in turn. War was endemic in the Buddha's age, ravaging northeast India again and again. Although kings and their ministers sought his counsel, the Buddha offered no grand political vision. He was powerless to stop the killing and the fighting. Even the men, women, and children of his former kingdom were massacred by a marauding king, forced into pits and trampled by elephants. It was said that the Buddha received the news in silence. Hundreds of them killed. So that day, Buddha was sad. Buddha's human being. So he act like a human being. So sometimes, you see, he also, you see, uh, I say they fail. He failed to perform miracle. The Buddha failed, but we as the Buddha fail constantly. Uh, and Part of our suffering is our, is our failure, our recognition of our failure. Buddhism doesn't argue with reality. There will always be both the potential for awakening in any moment and the potential for incredible damage at any moment. And if we fool ourselves into thinking we're past that, we will do incredible damage. Change, the Buddha said, must come from within. The Buddha starts always with the mind and talks about the violence in the mind and says that violence in the world is a result of violence in the mind. A tree lives on its roots. If you change the root, you change the tree. Culture lives in human beings. If you change the human heart, the culture will follow. For decades, the Buddha shared his teachings all across northeastern India. Let all beings be happy, he taught, weak or strong, great or small. Let us cherish all creatures as a mother her only child. Barefoot in his robes, he was still walking the roads when he was 80, but old age was upon him. His back hurt, his stomach was often in pain. I am old, worn out, he told a trusted disciple, like a dilapidated cart held together with thin straps. The world is so sweet, he said, that he could understand wanting to live for at least another century. But he was frail and exhausted. He became ill near Kushinagara, a remote village near the border of Nepal, when he was offered a meal which would prove deadly. The food was spoiled. He ate what was offered to him, and it said that he knew it was bad, but he took it anyway because it was offered and didn't want the person who offered it to feel bad because it was his time. <laughs> Oh, 
sarati sattadi Today, Kushinagara is revered by pilgrims as the place where the Buddha finally left the world. It was in Kushinagara where he grew weak and asked to be laid on his side in a quiet grove of sal trees. As he neared the end, his disciples began to weep stricken with grief. But the Buddha reassured them, all things change, he said. Whatever is born is subject to decay. He's saying this is a natural process. He tells his disciples, use this time, use the energy here, even this, for your own awakening. So he used even his own death and their sadness as a, a time to remind them of what their real task was. What he's actually doing is inviting those who are close to him into the experience. I don't think the Buddha's teaching uh, in any way argues against grief uh, or, or uh, sadness or loss. The teachings, if they make any sense, have to make sense in ordinary circumstances, in ordinary lives. And in ordinary lives, we grieve when we lose. We, we grieve, we, when, when, it, when it hurts, we say, ouch. Buddhism is trying to look at things the way they are, the way it is, just as it is. It hurts. This is life. This is our life. And our relation to life involves losing it, too. You don't get beyond these things. You don't get beyond them. It's all right to feel what human beings feel. And we are not supposed to turn into rocks or trees when we practice Buddhism. Buddhas laugh, cry, dance, feel ecstasy, probably even feel despair. It is how we know the world. It is how we live inside of our hearts and not dissociated from them. The Buddha had always been saying goodbye. Now he prepared to leave the earth forever. He would never be reborn, never die again. It may be that after I'm gone, the Buddha told his disciples, that some of you will think, now we have no teacher. But that is not how you should see it. Let the Dharma and the discipline that I have taught you be your teacher. All individual things pass away. Strive on, untiringly. These were the Buddha's last words. The Buddha died peacefully. His head was pointed to the north, his face to the west. The stories tell how the earth shook and the trees suddenly burst into bloom. Their petals falling gently on his still body, falling out of reverence. Divine coral flowers and divine sandalwood powders fell from above on the Buddha's body, out of reverence.
His disciples were quite upset. What are we going to do without our teacher? We will be lost without our teacher. But his instruction was so simple and so clear. I am not your light. I am not your authority. You've been with me a long time now. Be light. The Buddha saw death and life as inseparable. These are two sides of the same thing. Death is always with us. Death is part of the whole large unknown. And if we are unable to smile at the idea of the unknown, we're in real trouble. That's the realism that the Buddha was talking about, trying to come to terms with reality. When he was 29, and still Prince Siddhartha, the Buddha had left his wife, child, and family to try and understand the nature of suffering. attained enlightenment, shared what he had learned, and left a path for others to follow. was gone. But before he died, he had asked his followers to remember him by making pilgrimage to the place of his death, to where he gave his first teachings. Where he achieved enlightenment. he was born. Those four places mark out a sacred biography. And in tracing that pilgrimage route, you are learning the story of that life. At places of pilgrimage, temples were built, Images were installed and relics were enshrined. Millions of people get immense inspiration. Buddha spirit always there. But real Buddha's holy places is within oneself. That's important. So real Buddha's sacred place we must build within ourselves. We must build within our heart. Although the Buddha had predicted that his teachings, like everything else, would in time disappear, Buddhism flourished in India for 1,500 years, spread into Sri Lanka, Central and Southeast Asia, Tibet, China, Korea, Japan, and in the 20th century, to Europe and the Americas, adapting different forms and shapes wherever it took root attracting many millions of men and women who practice the Buddha's teachings both within and outside the monastic community. But everywhere and in every age, the essence of the story remains the same. 
The Buddha said that we've turned this world into a painful place, and this world does not have to be a painful place. This world can be a world inhabited by Buddhas, but it's up to each one of us to turn ourselves into a Buddha. That's real. That's the work. If the Buddha is not you, finally the Buddha is of no interest to you. The Buddha is the Buddha is of such interest to you because you are the Buddha. Every sentient being, even insect, have Buddha nature, the seed of Buddha. That's the seed of enlightenment. So therefore,、uh, there is no reason to believe some sentient being cannot become Buddha. So like that. I know that there are supposed to be preserved footprints of the Buddha, which are which are kept、uh, in in one of the sacred places in in India or Nepal, and you know you can stand in them, and if you stand in them, maybe you realize, ah, ten toes, me too. There is a story of a Brahmin who one day found the Buddha under a tree. Calmly meditating, the Buddha's mind was still. He radiated such power and strength that the Brahmin was reminded of a tusker elephant. The Brahmin asked him who he was. Imagine a lotus that had begun life underwater. The Buddha replied. But grew and rose above the surface until it stood free. So I too have transcended the world and attained the supreme enlightenment. Who are you then? The Brahmin wondered. Remember me, the Buddha said. As the one who woke up.